Hey guys, and welcome to the week one edition of the Fantasy Points UFL Breakdown. I'm your host, Jake Dribby, and I could not be happier to be back. This season, I'll be joined by Millionaire Maker winner and one of the greatest spring football DFS players ever, Neil Orfield. Neil, how are you doing? Excited for week one? Yeah, I mean, as a, a lifelong San Antonio Brahmas fan, I, a lot of people say I'm the original San Antonio Brahmas <laughs> fan, fan of the team long before they were good. Uh, very excited that the Brahmas are now looking like they at least have potential with a new coach, uh, a lot of new players this year. So yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for the UFL season, of course, excited for the DFS season as well, uh, and excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. So happy to have you. For those wondering about Chris, he, he just had a baby, so he's a little limited in terms of time, obviously. Um, won't be doing a ton of content for us, but he is helping on the back end with projections and everything. He's been, been a huge help, set up an awesome projection system for us, which we'll talk about throughout the show. Um, and yeah, I think we'll probably have him on as a guest at least once or twice throughout the year. Um, so before we get into these games, I did want to talk about some general UFL DFS best practices. We may have some new viewers, maybe people who are new to spring football DFS in general. So I just wanted to spend a couple minutes at the top of the show talking through, you know, some of the best practices to, uh, to go through when making your DFS lineups. Uh, the big one that I wanted to start with Neil is late swap. I feel like Absolutely nobody's doing it in spring football DFS, and I can't figure out why. The games are staggered throughout the weekend. You have plenty of time to make optimal swaps. If you're playing from behind, get aggressive. If you're favorite, if it looks like you're favored to win a contest, just play the highest projected player. Uh, anything to add on uh, on late swap, Neil? Yeah, I, th I think that that is great advice. And I, I have to admit, I have fallen into the trap of not doing a ton of late swap other than lineups that like look promising. Sometimes if a lineup is looking promising enough, then I'll go in and, and do the late swaps. Otherwise, I don't do the and I think it's great advice you you gave uh, in your article to to if you are playing from behind, you know, get a little wild, try and, you know, take take some risks to try to get over that money line threshold. I think that's great advice. Um, I, I've always struggled with the using uh, an optimizer. I've struggled with the, I try to get my ownerships just right on various players. And then it's like, for, for whatever reason, for XFL in particular, it was difficult for me if I made like minor adjustments uh, to, to get those things right. So I think that especially if you are only playing a handful of lineups, if you're playing, you know, five, 10 lineups, you absolutely should be utilizing late. So I think that was great advice you gave in your article. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, this is week one in a brand new league. So embracing randomness is going to be a pretty big deal. Um, Neil, do you have any ways that you like to kind of go about maybe when you're, uh, you know, using an optimizer or just making lineups by hand, embracing the randomness of, you know, a brand new league where we aren't really sure about a lot of these rotations? Yeah, I mean, you and I talked about it a little bit uh, in DMs. You, you said that you turn up your randomness, which I think is, you know, one way, certainly a, a great way to take advantage of the randomness of the league. I know a lot of DFS pros who do a, a similar approach who, you know, just increase randomness to account for the randomness. I play a little bit more of an exploitative style. So like if I think that two receivers are, you know, have about a similar range of outcomes or a similar uh, upside at the very least, and one of them is going to be 30% owned and one of them is going to be 10% owned. I try, I, I force my way to more of the 10% owned guy. So I, I, I actually don't do it by turning up randomness. I do it by increasing the projection of the player who uh, is going to get lower ownership just to try to exploit the field a little bit more. Um, but I think that, you know, that that's a matter of risk tolerance, largely like just turning up the randomness, you're likely to um, still get more of the guy that other people are getting less of. Um, but yeah, I, I like to like really force the issue when I think the field is playing it a little bit wrong, get a little bit more exploitative. Uh, but definitely, I, I agree. Like we gotta, we have to lean into the unknowns in a league like this. And there are a lot of them. Yeah, especially I think at wide receiver. I mean, you look at some of these rotations, you know, wide receiver three through wide receiver five is kind of just a guessing game. And, um, you know, the difference between these guys might only be a couple projected points, but, a, you know, an ocean of ownership, as I said in my article. So that's important to note. Um, beyond that, I think playing defense against an opposing quarterback, I, I'd really limit that to single stacks. But I do think that's that's plenty viable. If I remember correctly, in week two or week three of last year's XFL season, Luis Perez ended up being the optimal quarterback on a slate where he threw two pick sixes to the opposing defense. <laughs> right. So some really wacky stuff can happen in spring football. Um, do you have anything to add there in regards to you know playing opposing D against against a quarterback or a stack? Yeah, I think I might even do it uh, against a, a double stack, even more than uh, two opposing offensive players. But I think, I think that's I, I, I debate whether that whether I would go that far, just because, as you say, like it's just so so wild. First of all, there's there, there can be very low scoring in these games, so like a defense 
that puts up a, a defensive touchdown, you know, might be one of the the few uh, scores in the game. Um, and it could happen that, you know, there, there is a game, you know, we, we talk about this in show all the time where it's like, if a team gets a defensive touchdown, well, uh, the other team, the quarterback gets the ball in the back and now they're likely in a better passing situation. They're more likely to need to pass the ball. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I maybe it's not all that different from NFL, um, but I, I definitely uh, on a four game NFL slate, I might not play the defense against the opposing uh, quarterback on a four game XFL slate. I would. So, yeah I, yeah, I think that's a pretty good parameter that you set of just like maybe just a single stack. I might consider it with a double stack, but certainly uh, for a single stack. Yeah, I think I'll probably just limit it to single stacks, but I I could see the argument for doubles. Uh, speaking of stacks, um, how do you generally like to work through your stacking settings when you are making lineups? I know, you know, NFL people who play NFL DFS are probably familiar with, you know, playing a quarterback with two pass catchers and a run back. Um, you know, UFL, we have only eight teams. Uh, only seven spots, I think sk six skill position players that were that were rostering. So, um, yeah, Neil, how do you tend to handle stacking? Usually just single stacking here. Um, you could, I mean, th there are, I think you actually called this out in your article. There are situations like AJ McCarron, like is good enough, maybe can support a double stack. Uh, maybe there are some situations and we'll learn throughout the year. There might be other quarterbacks who can support a double stack more often, but just because it, it is so low scoring that uh, often uh, th there might be weeks where you don't get two wide receivers from the same team who put up 15 plus fantasy points. You still need to play a quarterback. So um, I, I'm only forcing a single stack. I still do always force at least a single stack, uh, even with rushing quarterbacks. But um, yeah, I typically don't force a double stack you could also give a boost to wide receivers with your quarterback so that you're a little bit more likely to get double stack if you wanted to force a double stack with somebody like an aj mccarron uh you you could do that but that is probably not how i'm going to play it i'm probably just going to be single stacking my quarterbacks yeah i think mccarron double stacks will be i mean as double stacks go i, I wouldn't be surprised if those ended up being 80 percent of the double stacks in yep. the field submits and i think that's fine we'll you know we'll talk about him in a bit beyond that i you know i i will be leaning more towards single stacks i might have a double here or there with some other quarterbacks that i like but it does feel a little thin especially for week one where we are largely trying to avoid you know total disasters from guys we're, we're rostering because those those do tend to pop up a lot in week one of these new spring leagues um all right. So, Neil, unless you had any other notes on best practices. Um, no, as we go, I'm sure they're all, there might be other things that pop yeah. up, but I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. So, for those unaware, Fantasy Points has a UFL DFS product this season. Um, we're about to get into the game shortly, but let me describe this for you. Here's what you're going to get. Player projections, main slate ownership projections, an exclusive UFL DFS Discord channel where you can directly ask me, Neil, Chris Wecht, or Johnny Proctor questions about the slate, access to my UFL articles, which will be, be behind the paywall either every other week or just from week two onward. We're still debating that internally. Um, and I do want to make one thing very clear about this product. We are going to set the market for UFL player projections. And you can access those market-making projections this week only for just $72. That's $6 a week over the full 12-week season. Every subscription on the site right now is 20% off until April 1st, thanks to the early bird discount. And you can use promo code UFL2024. Again, that's UFL2024. Uh, with that promo code, you get an additional 10% off either the UFL or the all-in package. So that's how you get the price down to $72. To me, this product is far too cheap, and I can promise it's the cheapest it will ever be. The early bird discount disappears next week, so you'll be paying more if you buy it next week. I fought hard behind the scenes to make it more expensive because I think we're giving way too much away for $72, but corporate is addicted to bringing value to subs, and what we have here is the best value in the industry. So if you're interested in, um, in my work, if you appreciate what we do on this show, then you'll probably like our projections, and those are available over at fantasypoints.com. Promo code UFL2024 for an extra 10% off an already discounted product. I do genuinely believe it's an incredible deal, and I, I wish it was more expensive because, again, I, I think we're giving too much away, and that's not a marketing ploy. That's how I genuinely feel. Um, all right, Neil, it's time. Let's get into these games. Uh, Let's do first it. game, uh, kicking off Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we have the Birmingham Stallions at the Arlington Renegades. Stallions are favored by three and a half. I'll be citing DraftKings lines here, but there are some discrepancies industry-wide if you're looking at betting markets. Uh, Stallions favored by three and a half. Uh, total here is 41.5. Um, Neil, did you have any uh, 
bets in mind when you saw this line or um, do things look about right here to you? Yeah, if I were going to make a bet, it would probably be on the Renegades taking the points there, three and a half point spread. Um, I the, the total is pretty low. Like normally, I want to take the unders, but they they actually set these totals fairly low this year, so I don't see any anything standing out from that forty one and a half total. Um, yeah, I think if I were to bet something, it would probably be uh, the Renegades, just because they do have some continuity there. Uh, with the coaching staff, the quarterback, I, I kind of like that. So I might take the the three and a half points there on the Renegades if I took anything. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I think the value is on Arlington. That's I've made two bets this week. That's not one of them. Um, I'll I'll highlight those as we go throughout the show. There there were two lines in particular that I thought were ridiculous. This is you know probably closer to correct, but I, I do see some value on Arlington. Um, and you know, that's largely because Birmingham lost Alex Magoo to the Packers practice squad. He was the 2023 USFL MVP. Now there are some big questions at, at quarterback, which we will talk about shortly. First, I wanted to get to injuries. There's really nothing to note in this game outside of, uh, Arlington wide receiver, Javante Payton did pop up on the injury report with a hamstring, but he practiced in full on Wednesday and Thursday and is set to play. So really nothing to worry about there. Um, Getting into this Birmingham side, Matt Corral has been declared the starting quarterback for the Birmingham Stallions. Um, the team also named Adrian Martinez as uh, QB2. Jamar Smith, who many of you may remember from the 2022 USFL season, will be inactive. Um, they have said that Adrian Martinez could get reps in this game. He's mostly a rushing threat from what I understand and everything I've looked at, he's a pretty terrible passer. Um, so I wouldn't expect, you know, much of a passing workload for Martinez. This should be for the most part Corral's offense. Um, Neil, do you have any takes on Matt Corral in a situation where we don't exactly know how much he's going to play? Birmingham's a little thin at wide receiver. Um, it's, you know, he's hard to love. I think this week. He, he is hard to love. I mean, we've got him what at 10% ownership, Honestly, seems about fair to me for Matt Corral. Uh, you do love that he has, you know, the the NFL pedigree came in as a, you know, pretty decent draft pick uh, in the NFL. Of course, didn't do anything there, but that's promising. Uh, as you pointed out in your article, kind of love to see that he is put in a situation, the RPO uh, offense, where he is kind of set up for success. Um, so I, you know, th there is a little bit to like there. I think that he's a large range of outcomes, I would say, for Matt Corral. Um, which at 10% ownership, you know, I, I would hope for it to be, I would, I wish it was a little bit lower than 10% at 10%. Honestly, it seems pretty fair to me for his range of outcomes. I don't really see, um, you know, I, I, I guess that, that kind of sums up. I think, I think it is a fair ownership at 10% for Matt Corral. How, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I feel pretty similarly. I do think you could, you, you know, you can certainly make an upside case for Corral. We saw this offense really cook with Alex Magoo last year in, like you noted, a very RPO heavy system. And Brett Whitefield, who does a lot of charting for us, he does a lot of draft stuff for us, really great analyst. He told me that Corral needs an RPO heavy system to be successful. So I think if you're, you know, you're arguing for Corral as a DFS play, it's that, you know, he he cooks in an RPO heavy system, gets to throw a lot of, you know, very quick reads, probably gets to run a decent amount too um, in a system like that. So I could see some upside, but it, you know, things are like Neil said, pretty wide range of outcomes here. Uh, moving along to the backfield, uh, backfield is going to be led by CJ Maribel. We're anticipating a roughly 65, 35 ish split between him and Ricky person. Um, Maribel had a ton, I believe around 90%, 85, 90% of the team's red zone carries last year. So he should carry pretty good touchdown equity. That said, I have seen a few things from the team. I mean, I haven't seen anything to indicate that, you know, they're going to be like a 50, 50 split or that person could, you know, somehow overtake Maribel, but everything that's come out of the team, all their scrimmage clips uh, have shown Ricky person with the first team offense. Uh, Ricky person clearly working ahead of uh, Larry Roundtree and drills and all that. Larry Roundtree is going to be inactive. So I do think, you know, if you're looking to dumpster dive at running back, Ricky person is a little interesting, um, but there's also a chance that he gets, you know, five or six touches and they're all outside of the red zone and, you know, he doesn't do much with them. And I, I actually think he's a pretty good player for what it's worth. Uh, Neil, do you have any takes on, on this backfield Maribel or, or person, if you're trying to save on salary? Honestly, you kind of just you kind of just uh, changed my take on the backfield with with that note about person practicing with the uh, top squad because I I was looking at it thinking you know Maribel already had 
fifty percent rush share essentially last year, and Person was with the team and didn't really do much. So I was thinking like, yeah. well, that's you know clearly like the, the runway is there for Maribel to just like have the backfield to himself because he you know already had fifty percent plus. You throw yeah. in that the other running back who is on the team uh, with Roundtree and active, the other running back like they already had him and they weren't really using him. So I thought, man, Mar- that looks great. Uh, now that you're you're pointing out uh, the the situation with Person being used a little bit with the ones uh, in practice, that actually kind of piques my interest because you can also, you know, look at it the other way. Maribel never played more than 50, has never had more than 50% of the rushing share. If they do think that person, you know, uh, if he can get a little bit more of the rushing share here and uh, looking around the industry, we, we have uh, Maribel at 28% ownership. I see him even higher elsewhere. That makes person a great leverage play in my opinion. Um, and of course, for, for showdown, even more so. But even on the main slate, I mean, person is relatively inexpensive. If he can get up to 40, 50 percent of the rushing share, he looks pretty interesting to me. You, you've kind of uh, piqued my interest there. Yeah, I think that's certainly possible. I will say, though, you know, the median here is, you know, certainly a, a split yeah. that pretty heavily favors Maribel, especially in the red zone. Um, I'm basing, you know, that that person take off of three or four clips from what looked like pretty clearly the first team offense. And, um, you know, Ricky person was was out there with them. But, you know, again, I, I do think it's it's pretty likely Maribel leads this backfield. Uh, but I, I'm with you. I, you know, person's going to be totally unowned. And, um, you know, most of these running backs are in a pretty tight range in terms of both pricing and their projections. So you can make a pretty unique lineup by dipping down into the gross, you know, what is he? 50, 50, 4,500. Oh, 4,500. Yeah. yeah. So you, you can certainly save some salary there. I, I do think that's interesting. Um, moving on to these wide receivers, uh, Amari Rogers should handle slot duties. That wasn't a super valuable role looking back. Um, but you know, we have him and he's way too expensive. So he's not like really popping as, um, a big value, but you know, he could, if he's, if you think Amari Rogers is really good, he was, you know, with the Packers just a few years ago. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he emerged a bit more, uh, really, I think the guys that you're, you're looking at though, if you are playing one of these wide receivers are Deion Kane, Gary Jennings and Marlon Williams. Uh, Marlon Williams was actually listed on the team's depth chart as Amari Rogers backup which I know threw a lot of people off. Most of us anticipated Mar- Marlon Williams would be the wide receiver one for this team. Um, he did tear his, ace, or his Achilles in week one of last season. Skip Holtz said that it, you know, in camp, he looks like he's really hasn't missed a beat. I listened to an interview with Marlon Williams where he did sound genuine when he said, you know, he's 100% back and all that, but I would imagine all these guys say stuff like that. Um, to me, I'm not too worried about them listing Marlon Williams as Amari Rogers backup because Throughout the history of these spring leagues, we almost always see wide receivers confined to either playing on the outside or playing in the slot. That's because of limited training camp time, limited time, you know, with the teams in general. So they just don't have time to learn all these wide receiver roles. Uh, Marlon Williams with the 2022 Stallions played both in the slot and out wide, which is extremely rare uh, for a spring football wide receiver. So that's important to note. Um, you know, even though he's listed as the backup, I do still anticipate a pretty good amount of playing time for Mar- Marlon Williams. Um, and I think he'll probably occupy one of the starting outside wide receiver spots. Granted, you know, Gary Jennings and Deion Kane are the guys who are listed as the starters. Deion Kane, I think, has a pretty secure role here overall. He had three touchdowns in the uh, 2023 USFL championship game, ended up winning uh, the MVP from that game. Um, and then Gary Jennings is only 3,900. And I think you could argue his route share will be anywhere from 30% to 70%, but I've always seen him as more of a go ball type special, you know, go ball deep, uh, deep threat type specialist. So, um, Neil, now that I've kind of run through all those guys, do you have any, any interest in these Birmingham wide receivers? Does anyone really stand out to you? I mean, Marlon, Marlon Williams, uh, is interesting. He's the, the classic pay up to be contrarian options where it's like, he's mm-hmm. too expensive clearly for his median outcome, yeah. but as you point out, like, uh, you know, you, you had him be, before seeing the depth chart, you thought he might be right there as wide receiver one, even with the depth chart, as you say, the, the, those aren't particularly meaningful for yeah. the UFL. So he could get, even if he doesn't start the game, he could, you know, work in as a backup at all the different wide receiver positions, still get a good amount of, uh, you know, activity there. So kind of interesting at uh, 7,200 for a guy who's not going to get any ownership on Marlon Williams. Um Dean Kane, you know, looks pretty good at 5,900. The price is right there. Um, I, I still think Amari Rogers, you know, he is listed as a starter. He's also, I'd say, uh, pay up to be a contrarian type of option. Although, what, what do we have the uh, the ownership there at for Amari Rogers? Because it might be maybe not Basically as contrarian. Nothing. 
Oh, it is. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I, I would throw him into that payoff to be contrarian. None of these wide receivers are guys that I feel particularly safe with um, yeah. on Birmingham. Um, they're not like my favorite wide receivers on the slate, but uh, the, the price tag on Deion Kane seems reasonable. And still, we don't have him at a ton of ownership. So I kind of do like Deion Kane. Um, I wouldn't say that I love any of these receivers, but I would say Deion Kane, probably my favorite. Um, Rogers, Williams pay up to be contrarian. Gary Jennings, what, what is the price tag on? 3900 Oh, yeah. So he's a, he's a decent value option as well. Who You know, one one long ball can pay it off. So, yeah, um, he, you know. he seems to me like a guy who's, you know, probably going to catch a 40 yard touchdown or will will zero on, you know, two targets, something like that. Depends on um, if you play him. If you play him, he's going to get a zero. If you yeah. don't play him, he's going to get that 40 yard touchdown. Exactly. Exactly. Um, if you are looking for safety, though, I'm among these Birmingham pass catchers, Jay Sternberger is ridiculously cheap. I believe he finished last season priced around 8,700, now 6,100. He's an every down tight end for Birmingham. Should lead the team in target share or at least be right there. We actually have quite a few talented tight ends in the UFL, which is exciting. I mean, previous spring leagues hadn't featured a lot of tight end talent. Um, so I would expect Sternberger to be right there as, you know, effectively the wide receiver one, even though he does play tight end. He has very strong touchdown equity. I believe led all USFL pass catchers last year in receiving touchdowns. Um, so yeah, if you're just trying to play corral with his, his best value, it's, it's pretty clearly Sternberger. And, you know, from a floor and median perspective, it really doesn't feel like anyone's that close. Yeah, it's funny because you know, if you if you were required to play a tight end here, Jay Sternberger would be like a lot. He'd be in 50% of lineups, I bet, if you yeah. were required to play a tight end. You're not required to play a tight end, but honestly, he still looks really good. Like he's still a great value uh, relative to his his salary and his projection. He still looks really good. He is uh, clearly the, the safest pass catching option for Birmingham. He is also going to get reasonable some, somewhere in the you know 20 to 30 percent ownership range i think is uh you can reasonably expect for jay sternberger and it is well deserved he's you know one, one of probably the safest option on the team yeah yeah for sure he will be among the most popular flex plays of the slate also chris chris shout out chris weck left a great note in the comments we did talk about this a few days ago these rpo heavy schemes do tend to favor wide receiver ones uh, which is kind of a knock against a guy like Gary Jennings and would be, you know, a, a plus for someone like Marlon Williams or, or Deion Cain, depending on who you think wins that role. I think it's good for Marlon Williams. But again, you know, we are we are guessing on a few of these spots a bit. So um, I, I think that's a great note from Chris Wecht. OK, we can move over to the Arlington side here. Um, Arlington quarterback going to be Luis Perez. He was traded to the Arlington Renegades, uh, I believe prior to week eight of the 2023 XFL season and went on an absolute tear. He was hyper efficient passing the ball around a 71% completion percentage. Bob Stoops has said in practice this year, he's completing about 75% of his passes. Perez has looked really good. He's a spring football veteran. Um, you know, he's very familiar with these leagues. Um, the problem is he doesn't run you know, doesn't really have a ton of touchdown equity, given how heavy um, Arlington tends to turn towards the run, especially inside the 10. They really like to give the ball to Davion Smith. Um, yeah, Neil, any interest in Luis Perez here? Kind of, yeah. He, he is one of the, there, there are some quarterbacks here that I would completely throw out, and I definitely would not list Perez there. Like, I think that he is a capable enough quarterback uh, that he could be good. The, the pass catching options are at least like, interesting to me so some decent pass catching options um yeah i, I think that you know and, and throw in the, the continuity aspect i also you know i mentioned it a couple times like oftentimes you see in ufl uh the defenses are good or, or sorry in spring football leagues defenses are good right away offenses kind of take a while to click so i do think there is extra value here in teams that have continuity on offense and luis perez was part of the team late last year uh, obviously the the team improved a lot after getting him so i do think that he is playable here i think that luis perez is fairly interesting probably top half of my quarterbacks um you know he's not my favorite he's not my second favorite but i do think you know there's continuity there. There are some um, interesting pass catching options. So and I think he's another one that you could consider. Um, I wouldn't force the double stack, but if I were hand building, I might consider doing some Luis Perez double stacks for the reason you said is he, he you know, doesn't run a whole lot. Um, I do think he has multiple pass catching, uh, interesting pass catching options that are at different price points. So I do kind of like uh, the idea of a double stack here with Luis Perez and two pass catchers. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be playing some. Yeah, and I, I would imagine that's going to be really contrarian. I mean, we only have Perez projected for 7% ownership. And I mean, I noted this in my article. These Arlington wide receivers are really tough to project. We expect 
uh, you know, target and route shares to remain pretty flat among all these guys. I, I think I said in my article that last year there were only four instances of an Arlington wide receiver earning a route share over 70% throughout all of last season. That's uh that's pretty tough. Uh, we'll get to the backfield here in a minute, but if you are looking at these wide receivers, do you have any any preferences? Yeah, I mean, I definitely like Deontay Burnett. Uh, maybe, maybe that's my XFL bias, but uh, Deontay Burnett was just so great last year. I, I kind of think uh, that. So I we we didn't see the wide receivers have any any wide receiver really take off last year as like the guy, but Deontay Burnett I think is probably the most talented pass catcher he has had as an option. Um, so I do think you know there there are a few guys. Of these pass catchers, and of course, Sal Canell is still there as a tight end. Um, so he, you know, you, you could just play him with his tight end, Sal Canell. But I, I really like so uh, Deontay Burnett, probably my favorite wide receiver on the team. I'm sort of interested in Isaiah Winstead, just based on like a little bit of hype, based on the price tag. He sounds like the kind of guy who it might not happen week one, but like could take on a bigger role than we're expecting. Like it sounds like he has the talent, the coaching staff likes him and he is inexpensive. So it is a situation where I think I'm going to try and make that bet before we actually see it. And that, I'm not going to have him in 50% of my lineups, but I might play, you know, 10% or so of Winstead. And I, I think that would be uh, well over what we have him projected out. Let me, let me pull that up. What do we have Winstead at? Um, basically nothing. He's, yeah, I mean, he's very difficult to project because like I said, these, you know, we expect these shares to be so flat among these yeah. guys and Bob Stoops has really hyped him up. So, I mean, Winstead could be out there for three routes or he could get, you know, 18 or 20. We really, we really aren't exactly sure. Um, for me, I don't think he's much of a main slate play. I just see a little too much risk there. And I also think with the pricing dynamics this week, a lot of stars have been priced down relative to what True. they were near the end of last season. So I do think like pretty much everyone's going to be pushed towards more balanced builds. Um, and uh, realistically, I just don't think you have to dumpster dive much because you can get, you know, Hakeem Butler and Jay Sternberger and all these guys for way cheaper than you would have been able to near the end of last season. So I'll probably be looking at Winstead more as like a showdown type play. Uh, maybe you, I, you are I not interested in playing the 50th top projected wide receiver on this four game slate. I cannot <laughs> believe that you're not. I see. I, I just think that it's uh, the, the median doesn't account for the, the full range of outcomes. Like I think that there are situations where he puts up basically nothing. I think I would probably project him just a little bit better than we have him at. Um, but I, I, I hear you. You, you. you are right that like you don't really need to be going into these plays on this yeah. slate just because we do have some really cheap options, not not even just a wide receiver, but like across the board, we've got some cheap options. So you don't really need to go dumpster diving. But uh, I'm, I'm embracing the variance. I might I might get up to maybe I won't get up to 10 percent, but I'll, I'll you know get a little bit in there, I think. Yeah, on the on showdown, Winstead is the minimum price. So yeah. I really, I really like him there. And I don't think we have Saturday only contests up yet, but um if those do go up, I you know, I'd I'd consider him in that as well. Um all right, any other notes? Oh, well, I guess we should probably talk about Sal Canella. He's kind of similar to Jay Sternberger. Um, I think Sternberger's a slightly better play, but he's you know, he's priced down from last year. Canella finished uh, the XFL season priced around seven thousand, now around fifty five hundred. Um, you know, he has the best target floor of all these pass catchers. He's the only guy that I can pretty much guarantee is going to earn a route share over 65 or 70%. Um, but we really didn't see a ton of upside with him, you know, uh, in the Luis Perez offense last year. So it's, you know, it's probably more of like a floor and median type play. I don't know if he's a guy that I really love that much for, for tournaments. I, I, I just kind of feel fine about him. Any, any take there? Yeah, I mean, at 12% ownership, I think I, I like him better than 12% ownership, most likely okay. 5,500, um, you know, with, with my if, if I do play some Luis Perez double stacks, if you don't want to get crazy with me and go all the way down to Winstead, I think you could just play Burnett and Canela in a Luis Perez double stack, and that will be fairly contrarian. And I think it has, I think it actually has a, a decent floor and a decent ceiling. Maybe I'm wrong about the floor. Maybe, maybe there's not as much floor as you know, really across the UFL. What, what are we talking about as far as floor? But I think the, like, the likelihood of hitting a, a median or, or ceiling is, is pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's fair. Um, final note, I guess this is pretty much only for showdown before we talk about this backfield. Uh, Bob Stoops has said Lindsey Scott Jr. will get some rushing packages. He's the backup quarterback behind Perez. He's a very talented athlete. He threw for 60 passing touchdowns in his final FCS season, which is insane. Um, I was wondering if he might end up being the starter, but it does make sense they wanted to go with Perez. Still, he's a very talented rusher. So if you're a showdown sicko, maybe he could score a touchdown. It's it's thin, but I, I figured I'd throw that out there. Um and then the backfield here is 
pretty straightforward. Uh, Davion Smith is your classic workhorse if you're used to Scott Barrett running back definitions. Um, he's going to get a ton of carries, uh, not going to catch many passes, and he's going to get a ton of goal line work. So his touchdown equity is very strong. But if there's a scenario where Arlington fa falls behind here, like, you know, Birmingham gets up 14 to nothing, Davion Smith is basically total dust because he doesn't catch passes. That role goes to Letty Brown. Letty Brown had an 11% target share with Luis Perez um, from week eight through week 11 last season. Uh, that's a little encouraging, but you know, to me, I don't really see him as a main slate play. I'd probably rather take the risk on Ricky person just because I, I can't see Letty Brown ever overtaking Davion Smith in, in terms of rushing share or red zone work. I mean, red zone carries are going to be really hard for Letty Brown to ever come by. Uh, do you have any takes on this backfield before we move on to the next game? Yeah, I would say Davion Smith is the classic, like, play that I would like to play at low ownership because he doesn't have a lot of talent, but he has the opportunity. So like what, two, th three yards per carry uh, doesn't get you that far, but you, you know, if he, he's probably the, the goal line guy, so likely to uh, have opportunities at the goal line. Now you add, throw in the threat of the backup quarterback. That might be the kind of package where they want to use him. Is at the one yard line at the goal line, throw in the backup quarterback. Um, so at ownership, I don't love Davion Smith uh, just because we do have a ton of ownership going there. What do we have? 20, 26% going to Davion Smith right now at 8,200. Um, he does have, you know, the he has a, a decent floor just based on volume. Um, as you said, I, I I was looking for for ways to poke hole in here. You, I, I was asking before, and I couldn't find the uh, the game logs. There was a period last year where it looked like Letty Brown was going to be uh, taking over a little bit more from Devion Smith, like he was eating into it. And I think Smith actually got it back surprisingly, which I wouldn't expect for a, a running back who is as inefficient as he is. Yeah. But it seemed like uh, I think, at, uh, as I recall, toward the end of the year, he kind of took back that role. Um, so maybe. Uh, he, Letty is not going to be much of a threat there. So I think the volume is pretty safe. Um, I do think that there is kind of a limited ceiling outside of multiple touchdown game. There's limited ceiling just because, as you said, doesn't catch passes uh, and doesn't have efficiency as a running back. So um, I don't love it at the ownership. I'm probably going to be underweight to Devion Smith and, and take risks on some other running backs that are a little bit less projectable. Yeah, uh, uh, just a note on that Davion Smith usage to end last year. He got hurt in week nine. I believe he had a pretty gnarly ankle sprain. Missed week 10 because they were already locked into a playoff spot and they decided to rest him. So that may, you know, uh, account for some of the usage discrepancy okay. uh, you noted there and and probably inflated a little bit of Letty Brown's uh, receiving numbers towards sure. the end of the season. Um, all right. Next game, this is, uh, we got two games Saturday, two games Sunday. So this is our second Saturday game. Kicks off at 4 p.m. Eastern time. The St. Louis Battlehawks favored by seven points at the Michigan Panthers. Total here is 42. Um, so I'm going to lay out my case for the over, which I feel very strongly about. Um, our numbers have this closer to 46 as the correct total. Yeah. Um, I have a few points to make here. One is that the kickoff and punt rules are very favorable to starting field position in this new league. I'd expect starting field position to be somewhere around the 30, 35 yard line, maybe pushing the 40. Um, uh, the USFL kickoff rules in particular, which this new league adopted, are, are very favorable to starting field position. Um, this is also the most uh, continuity we've seen uh, among spring football teams, you know, pretty much ever. And they've had a longer training camp than they ever had before. The four week training camp is the longest training camp that we have seen. This is the best offense in the UFL, St. Louis, and what I think is probably going to be an average offense in Michigan. Um, and again, I just think, you know, these teams have such an advantage because, you know, McCarron's been with the team for over a year. We've seen throughout the history of spring football, offenses get more efficient as the season goes on. Neil, you kind of already noted that. Um, yeah, I think this total is way too low. I saw Bookmaker, which is an offshore book, kind of in the same realm as uh, Pinnacle and Circa, very sharp, charge a low vig. Uh, they actually had a 41 for the total and plus 102 on the over. So I'm going to hit that as soon as the show's over, um, because to me, that's just ridiculous. But uh, Neil, are there any arguments against me for the under here? No, I, I think you actually laid out a really good case. The the longer spring, uh, the as we said, the, the continuity with the Battle Hawks, you can expect the offense to come in looking pretty good from the start. So I'm into it. I think that, you know, typically I, I like unders in these spring football leagues, but um, you, you've made a strong case for the, the, the long spring and the continuity of the Battle Hawks. Uh, I'm into it. Yeah, let's take the over there. Oh, and it looks like DraftKings just lowered the line half a point. So you can get 41 and a half now over on DK, which they did not buy your argument. They were like, no, I, 
I, I got really good closing line value on almost all my XFL bets last year. I think probably closing line value on 80% of them by at least a point. And nice. I cannot believe this is, I bet over 42 and a half and it keeps moving against me and I'm going to keep betting more. Um, I, you know, I might get bankrupted if this game goes under, but I feel like I have a very good case yeah. for the over here. Uh, in terms of the spread, I don't really see a ton of value. St. Louis is really, really good. Uh, seven points is maybe a bit too much, but I mean, that's about where we have it. Any, any take on that? Yeah, honestly, it seems pretty fair to me. Um, yeah, no, no disagreement there. Yeah. All right. Um, so the St. Louis side, this is pretty awesome. If you love scoring fantasy points in spring football, then you're going to love the St. Louis Battlehawks. They're led by AJ McCarron, who is the 2023 XFL MVP. He was very, very, very good last year, especially as spring football quarterbacks go. I mean, he could easily be on a practice squad, but he wants to play football uh, for his sons. He said that many times his, his sons, sons are young boys and um, they, you know, they didn't get to see him play at Alabama. They didn't really get to see the starts that he made in the NFL. So now they get to see him play for the St. Louis Battlehawks. And I think that's pretty neat because AJ McCarron has by far the best receiving group in the uh, UFL. I almost said XFL. Oops. Um, led by Hakeem Butler, who is an absolute monster. Also have Darius Shepard. Marcel Aitman and Blake Jackson, all of whom are expected to you know, see a good amount of work here. Jacor Pearson, who many of you remember from last year's 2023 XFL season, is also on this roster, but he's on IR until week six. Um, so by the end of the season, this team is going to be stacked. If you can find St. Louis plus 500 still, I believe Caesars hung that um, for the uh, UFL championship. I think that's the best futures bet you could possibly make. They're my number one team in my power rankings. I think they're going to be really good. Uh, but Neil, I'll throw it over to you. How do you feel about McCarron and his pass catchers uh, for the four game slate? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I have two favorite quarterbacks on the slate, and he is certainly one of those favorite quarterbacks. He has, I'd say, the highest floor and the highest ceiling. Um, really, the only downside here is there are four core, uh, four wide receivers who I think like are very in the mix to be like top two wide receivers like it's kind of unclear to me who is going to be uh the who who are going to be the top receivers for the battle hawks i do think that it's pretty likely to be hakeem butler number wise i guess it's gonna be more of a mess when Decourt pearson comes back and suddenly you have five uh previously great wide receivers all competing um but yeah it, it's certainly i'm gonna want to play aj mccarron i'm probably going to be playing some double sacks with aj mccarron i might mix up who I have in those double stacks, just because I do think that there are so many strong receiving options here for the Battle Hawks. Uh, as I mentioned, this is one of the teams that does have continuity coming from last year, both in terms of the coaching staff and the quarterback. Um, some of the same receivers also uh, hard, hard not to love the spot here for the Battle Hawks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, to me, I, you know, I'm, I'm viewing Darius Shepard as the best overall value here. Hakeem Butler has, by far, to me, the best ceiling of any receiver in the UFL. Um, he's just an absolute monster. Plus, he's he kind of gets like the old Packers Devontae Adams treatment near the goal line, where they just like to draw up these very quick plays. And speaking of goal line passing, St. Louis set the modern spring football record for pass rate inside the red zone last season. They trust A.J. McCarron much more than they trust their running backs to score touchdowns when they get close to the goal line. So that's another important note. That's why McCarron projects so well in part um, because his passing touchdown equity is so much higher than any other quarterback. Um, the backfield here looks pretty straightforward. Uh, Going to be Wayne Goldman, Goldman in the old Brian Hill role. Goldman, obviously an NFL veteran. Originally, this team had Max Borgie. He ended up, uh, I'm not sure if he's officially retired, but he did step away for, for this season. Um, and then it looks like Jacob Sailors is going to be the backup running back here. I, I mean, I like Gallman. I think Gallman's probably going to, you know, earn about 70% of backfield work in an offense that we expect to score, you know, 25, 26, 27 points. Um, that feels pretty good, obviously, on the surface. But like I highlighted before, touchdown equity is a legitimate concern here, given how much St. Louis throws in the red zone, uh, specifically, you know, to Hakeem Butler and, and their wide receivers. You have any take on, on this backfield or Gallman? Yeah, I, I really like Gallman. Um, I'd say, you know, uh, what do we have? We have uh, Gallman is 300 more expensive than Davion Smith uh, and only projected for 4% more ownership. I'm just, I, I would lean into more Gallman at the expense of Davion Smith. Personally, I think that the 
the offense is just so much better. I think the player is so much better. Uh, he can also be involved in that passing game potentially. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I agree with you. There, there's some concern about the, uh, the the touchdown equity for Gallman, but I think we, we could see him just be a, a total workhorse and maybe pick rack up some PPR points along with rushing efficiency. So I, I like Gallman personally uh, significantly better than Davion Smith. Uh, I will, it wouldn't surprise me if I end up overweight to Gallman. I, I think that both the ceiling and the floor are pretty high there for Gallman. It, it helps that Mateo Durant is inactive. So really we just have two running backs uh, to worry about there. And I think Gallman's I th pretty clearly going to be the, the lead back. I guess we can't say for certain in the UFL, but I definitely expect him to be the lead back over Jacob Saylor's. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in on Gallman this week for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I certainly prefer him to Davion Smith. I, you know, I wonder if we're, we may have to bump Davion Smith's ownership down a bit. Cause I do think most people will probably lean that way, but I agree. I mean, you know, Gallman could, despite the overall touchdown equity of the backfield, not being great. Gallman could still score three touchdowns if St. Louis just has a monster offensive performance. Right. right? So yeah, I mean, it's easy to see an upside, uh, an upside or easy to make an upside case for him. Uh, Jacob sailors, I think is pretty interesting for showdown though. Uh, my one note here on these backup running backs was that despite a 28% snap share in their games with Brian Hill, the backup running backs actually earned 43% of the team's red zone carries. So there is a little bit better touchdown equity, it seems, for these backups um, than their snap shares might imply. But, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that regressed more towards a normal number and, and you know, Gallman just ended up taking 60 or 70 percent of the red zone carries. Anyway. It could also be a Brian Hill thing. Like, we yeah. don't know for sure if yeah. that's like a who knows. It could, it could be the coaches right. like to use the backup running back, but it could just be they didn't like Brian Hill in that spot. So, yeah, maybe um, yeah, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out pretty soon. Yeah, we will. And then for my showdown sickos, and this is probably realistically more of a note for later in the year, but this team, they listed Jake Sutherland as the starting tight end. These tight ends barely play in part because Hakeem Butler kind of functions as like a move tight end within the offense. They use them in a lot of creative ways. It's, it's pretty fun, but um, Jake Sutherland is the listed starter. He, you know, had a 3% target share last year. Not a guy I'm particularly excited about. Kamari Averett, though, is like as the season goes on, I think could potentially emerge as a legitimately good spring football tight end. Um, Scott Barrett, you know, I stole this blurb from his, uh, I believe, 2023 or 2022 tight end uh, uh, like draft article, which, you know, Scott's draft articles are just absolutely insane. If you like my stuff, you will love Scott's draft content. I promise you that. Um, but Averett, his yards per game was this among tight ends, sixth best since 2014. He did play in the FCS, so keep that in mind. Uh, touchdowns per game, ninth best since 2014. Yards per hour run, sixth best since 2014. And if you touchdown adjust his yards per hour run, fourth best since 2014. Averett might be really good. We we don't know. Um, and he might also be the backup tight end and only earn a 15% route share. But I do think that's an interesting note as the season goes on. If you see him start to emerge, I would I would lean into that pretty heavily. Um, and maybe for showdown, you can toss out an Averett lineup or two. I'm sure it'll, it'll make Scott Barrett happy, so... Um, you know, gotta, gotta help him out. Yeah. Um, I think he's the perfect showdown play. And I, I'm just so sad that there's no UFL best ball because that would be an absolute smash <laughs> play in, in best ball. Oh yeah, totally. He would be, uh, he would be the ultimate final, your 18th round pick yeah, in exactly. the UFL best ball. Um, all right. So moving along to the Michigan side here, EJ Perry has been named the starter, but we are giving a little bit of, uh, you know, fantasy work, pass work to, and rush work to backup quarterback, Danny Etling. We saw Mike Nolan, the Michigan head coach, use a, a kind of gross two QB system uh, from weeks one through five in the USFL last year with the Michigan Panthers. Um, but the nice thing about Mike Nolan is that he hired a new offensive coordinator, Marcel Bella Fuel. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but he was the old passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach for the now defunct Philadelphia Stars, um, who, if any of you remember, were the only air raid team in the old USFL. So we anticipate an air raid offense here, which is generally pretty good for fantasy production. Um, and I think, you know, we saw Case Cookus run a bit in this offense last year. Perry has shown some rushing ability. So um, I think he's kind of comparable to Case Cookus in a lot of ways for those who are familiar with the old Philadelphia Stars. Um Wide receiver, I think, is pretty interesting here. It's it's a little tricky. Um, they did only list three starting wide receivers on the depth chart, but it's worth noting that these air raid teams start four wide receivers. So, um, yeah, Neil, do you have any leans here? You know, if you're playing Perry, do you, do you like him? And then, you know, who do you pair him with? 
Yeah, I'll probably play some parry. I don't think I'm going to go too crazy with it. We have the ownership at 8.8%. Again, I think that that probably seems about fair. Uh, I don't I don't think I'm going to be above that number. I think, if anything, I might actually come in a little bit under on parry. Uh, we, we actually haven't projected ahead of Luis Perez. And I think that I prefer Perez at the 7% over parry at 9% where we have them. So I don't totally love parry, um, but I'll probably play Maybe I'll get to 5% parry, something like that. You know, I, I want to have some exposure there. I think that uh, he could be kind of interesting, but he's not uh, not somebody that I'm going out of my way to get a ton of. As far as the pass catchers go, I think Trey Quinn, probably my favorite. I think this is part of the reason I don't, uh, I'm probably not going to play a ton of parries that I don't have a lot of confidence in the wide receiver situation. I think Trey Quinn pretty clearly, or I'm, I'm expecting him to be the wide receiver one. So I think that uh, I would probably play some parry with Quinn lineups. Um, you could play him with Gray or Sewell if you want to. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be getting to a ton. So I think this is largely a spot where I'm going to be underweight to the field. Uh, but I don't hate the idea of doing a few lineups of uh, parry with Quinn primarily in, you know, Gray or Sewell if, uh, if you want to go that route. I think are in play as well. Yeah, so I do think I like Perry a little bit more than ownership implies. A big part of that is because he he showed like really good ability um, in the semifinals of the USFL playoffs last year against the Pittsburgh Maulers, who, who had a pretty good pass defense. He threw for 370 yards, 9.7 yards per attempt, two touchdowns. Um, that that game legitimately impressed me, and I think if he can you know manage something similar in this Philadelphia stars offense or, you know, find his groove. Um, he could be a pretty good fantasy contributor. Like I said, he can run a little bit, so I, you can make an upside case for Perry, but, um, oh, and you know, Michigan's going to have to throw a ton. I mean, their base pass rate is going to be over 60% and St. Louis is probably going to dominate this game. So I wouldn't be surprised if 70% of their plays were dropbacks here. Um, I should, yeah. I should acknowledge once again, my, my XFL bias. So this is, this is another <laughs> spot where I, I don't know the player as well. Cause I was way more into the XFL than the USFL last year. So maybe it's just a matter of, I don't know EJ Perry that well, you know, the little bit yeah. I've read on him is like, yeah, he's kind of interesting, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Luis Perez, I'm like, I kind of understand the situation a little bit better. So, yeah. so maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong to, to prefer Perez over uh, Perry, but um, well, Maybe that's a like maybe that's a bit of a note for ownership. I would imagine most of our audience is probably more familiar with the XFL than the USFL. Probably that's most good people point. playing good in point, these actually. contests are. Yeah. So I mean, maybe lean into the USFL side of things um a bit more if we assume the XFL players will be more popular because of our familiarity with them. True. Um, but I, I'm with you. You know, wide receiver is pretty tough. Marcus Sims is listed as a starter, only 3,100. He's, you know, he's their kick returner. He's an amazing kick returner, but you know, I see him in a similar light to a guy like Jerry uh Gary Jennings, where he's probably just a a deep ball specialist, you know, either he zeroes or he um, he catches you a touchdown. I suppose in, you know, in something like showdown, I actually wouldn't hate pairing him with the Michigan defense. Um, Oh, someone asked for the uh, the promo code. That would be UFL 2024 for the discount. UFL 2024. Um, and then, yeah, beyond that, uh, it is a little tough. Also for showdown, you could argue because this team kept three tight ends on the roster. One of them is going to be inactive on game day. But because they kept three tight ends on the roster, which is unusual for an air raid team, maybe they intend on using tight ends a little bit more. Um, in that case, Cole Hikutini would be your, your lead tight end there. You could maybe lean into him. In a showdown type format, I, I don't know. I think it's fairly thin. I mean, realistically, a lot of these air raid tight ends only run a route on twenty five percent of dropbacks, and it's not a great role. Um, the backfield here is certainly interesting. It's going to be led by Wes Hills, who is the greatest bell cow in the history of modern spring football. Um, he had monster workloads game after game after game with the New Orleans Breakers last year. Uh, the only problem is that the the offensive coordinator, formerly of the Philadelphia Stars brought over the Philadelphia Stars running back, Matthew Colburn. Right now, we have Wes Hills getting most of the rushing work, getting uh, you know a little bit better touchdown equity, and then Colburn seeing most of the receiving work. I do view Colburn as a, as a notably better receiver, although Wes Hills is capable as a receiver. Um, I could really see this backfield going either way. I wouldn't be surprised if they leaned more into Colburn, but Wes Hills just has such a history. I mean, I think he had a 20 touch game in, in the NFL in like a meaningless week 17 game or something a few years ago. So coaches clearly know that Wes Hills can carry the workload. I mean, I could, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if he was a bell cow. I, 
I wouldn't be surprised if it leans 60, 40 in favor of Colburn. I, this, this is tough. Neither of them project particularly well for us. I guess Colburn's the better value, but w- what do you think? Yeah, I have the uh, very same cloudy understanding of the situation that you have. I like it though. For, from a from a DFS perspective, I think we can kind of lean into the uncertain here because I think that for both running backs, there's a pretty wide range of outcomes, uh, and we don't have a ton of ownership going to either. So West Hills, you know, eighty nine hundred. He the, the price is up there for for West Hills, uh, but we're coming in at fifteen percent ownership again. I think that's the spot where. Uh, if if the ownership and it sounds like the ownership might change on Devion Smith, but I would probably if it stayed here, I'd rather get a little bit more of Wesso. So that might lead into a little bit more of my Devion Smith exposure um, because if he is if he if he you know returns with the same role that he had last year, like that is a great situation for Wes Hills. But I also and I. I don't know that I, would, I probably would not play them together, which I, I often will play two running backs from the same team uh, in spring football. I don't know that I would play these two together because I think that the reason that we're playing either of them is leaning into the volatility of we don't really know what the workload is going to be. And if yeah. they're splitting, it's it's going to be tough for them to both pay off their salaries. But I do like them both on different teams because uh, we also have Coburn. He, he's only 56 hundred uh if yep. i'm and we have him at like virtually zero ownership so as you yep. said he's he's following his coach here sometimes there is some loyalty there that is hard to account for he's a capable they're, they're both capable pass catchers love that 5600 1.4 percent ownership might take on more of the workload than anybody expects so I, I actually like both of the running backs uh for uh for this team yeah and they project as poor values because if you project any kind of a split with how their salaries are, they're just not going to project as very good value. So you're not going to get a ton of these guys in an optimizer. I do kind of like the idea of, of bumping them up a little bit more, probably West Hills in particular, um, because I think he could, you know, even if it isn't a true bell cow workload, he could certainly have a monopoly over the goal line work. I, I just yeah. view him as a much more physical runner than Colburn, who, you know, can earn goal line carries and is, you know, isn't just uh a receiving back, you know? So, uh, like we said, this could really go either way, but that is kind of a volatile spot to, to lean into. A bit. I, I would add this just, just because they are both capable pass catchers because it's so low scoring in, uh, spring football in, in, in general, like players just don't score as many fantasy points. Yeah. Those receptions are that much more valuable for, for running back. So if you do have a running back and that's part of the, part of the reason I don't love Devin Smith, he doesn't really get those receptions. Whereas these guys throw in four receptions for a Coburn, like yeah. that's like, gets you most of the way to a touchdown. So even, even without, if, if he doesn't have the uh, TD equity, like just having those reception equity goes a lot further in the UFL than the NFL, just because, you know, points are harder to come by. Yeah. And he does have, a, a above average receiving touchdown equity for a running back because yeah. Philadelphia, I promise you will run this play multiple times where around the 25, they throw a, re, a wheel route to the running back and it, it's always worked pretty well. They've scored multiple touchdowns on this throughout the year. So Coburn will score a touchdown on one of these re, wheel routes eventually. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, moving along here to the first game on Sunday, we have the DC defenders at the San Antonio Brahmas. This game kicks off at noon Eastern time. DC is uh, favored by six points. Total here is 44. Um, I don't see a ton of value on bets in this game. We a lit, maybe a little bit of value to the over. I think um, one thing that I forgot to mention at the top of the show is I think you could argue based on sort of the case I made for the over in the St. Louis, Michigan game, you know, team continuity rules being uh favoring offense all that um parlaying all the overs together you could get some some decent correlation there at uh at your favorite book because you know scoring will be correlated across the league um so i you know i don't even hate all unders if you want to go that route but i I would prefer overs um yeah i guess i see you know if i had to pick something i would bet on san antonio here but i don't you know i don't really love it uh yeah obviously i would i would bet on san antonio if i were gonna (laughs) pick something uh in this game um yeah i I definitely take the points on san antonio i I might even actually uh make make the bet straight up i do think that they just have such a i I love the coaching staff for san antonio uh the quarterback is is going to be interesting particularly i mean quentin dormady was really good last year so throwing a quarterback who beat out quentin dormady in the spring that's kind of interesting to me so yeah i would say if i were going to bet anything here it would be on the san antonio side but as you pointed we do have some sort of continuity with DC, like the coach and the quarterback stay the same. The wide receiver core is very different. So it's like, yeah. you know, there kind of goes both ways as far as continuity there for DC. Um, but yeah, I think if I were taking anything, it would probably be uh, on the San Antonio side. And I will again note my my bias here. 
No, I think I think that's fair. If I if I had to take something, it would also be the San Antonio side. Uh, we do have a notable injury here. Uh, DC wide receiver Vincent Smith has not practiced all week. We're projecting him out right now. We should get these inactives later tonight. I really appreciate that the league is releasing inactives about 36 hours before kickoff. Makes all of our lives a lot easier. We won't have to worry uh, too much or hopefully at all about surprise inactives uh, before you know these Saturday or Sunday games. Which is nice. So that, you know, if, assuming Vincent Smith is out, that will condense uh, a, what is a fairly tricky wide receiver room to decipher um, a bit. We'll start on the D.C. side with uh, quarterback Jordan Tayamu, you know, obviously a holdover from last season. He's uh, fairly talented as spring football quarterbacks go. You know, he can run. Um, he was a really efficient passer in his final few games last year. I believe final six, seven weeks had a PFF passing grade around 85. Looked really good. Um uh, this offense skews extremely run heavy, but, you know, Tayamu has been so efficient that it really hasn't held him back in terms of overall passing statistics. Granted, you know, the touchdown equity, especially inside the red zone, isn't great. The team really leans run heavy inside the red zone. Um, I think the trickiest part with Tayamu though, is like, who, who do you pair him with? I mean, right now we have Brandon Smith. He's uh, really the only holdover from last year among these wide receivers um, and Kiki Cutie, who's really expensive as you know, his top options. Um, Kelvin Harmon also has NFL experience. We tentatively expect him to also work in with the starters. I I don't know. This this is a little tricky, Neil. Tayamu projects well, but his receivers are are tough. What do you think? Yeah, so I noted my XFL, but I also, I think I also have a bias for like former NFL players. So I think Kiki <laughs> Cutie, I'm like, oh man, what if he is an NFL receiver playing in the UFL? He could absolutely yeah. dominate this league. Of course, it didn't really happen last year the, the, mm-hmm. to the extent that I expected. I can't even remember the names anymore, but there were a few wide receivers who I was really leaning into. I, there was one team that had two former NFL receivers, and I forget, I'm blanking on who they were at this point, but uh, neither of them were actually that great in, in the XFL last year. But I kind of want to try it again with uh, Kiki Cutie. I think that there is at least... Early on, we can at least you know lean into the upside of what if he is just an NFL receiver playing in the UFL, playing with Jordan Tiamu. And, and of course, we love that Tiamu no longer has Derek King there because Derek King was like, he was always going to take that goal line role from Tiamu. Yeah. Like, he scored so many of those goal line touchdowns. And it was like, what? why not just, because Tiamu is a runner himself. It was so frustrating because it was like, why not just leave Tiamu in there? Because he's a, he's a good enough runner. He can get it done himself. They do have Jalen McClendon now in that role, but I don't think that he is as much of a threat as uh Derek King was. So I think it's possible that Tiamu, you know, his, his role takes another step forward. He gets a little bit more of that uh running role. Um and then I like the idea. My my favorite uh pairing partner is uh Kiki Cutie. He is of course 8500 so you are paying up there for Kiki Cutie. Um you know if, if you want to go Brandon Smith there's there is a possibility that once again Kiki Cutie we just want to play him because he's a former NFL guy and maybe Brandon Smith is actually more talented or just as talented and he's only 4900 so i'd probably be one of those two for me would be the favorite to pair with Tiamu um but i do think you know i i like Tiamu he's probably my third or fourth favorite quarterback on the slate yeah yeah i think i think that's fair cutie is tough you know josh hammond only averaged about 4.9 uh targets per game and 7.3 fantasy points per game in this slot role last year so mm-hmm. if you think you know cutie is only going to play in the slot for dc it, it's hard to argue you know that he's going to be some winning tournament play um especially at 8900 so so that's tough at the same time though neil like you said if he's an nfl receiver on a ufl field they're going to find a way to play him outside and just get him the ball um, so I think, you you know, I could see cutie going either way where it's just like, oh, this role is a, a complete disaster and he's only earning four and a half targets per right. game and it's way too expensive or they're just absolutely feeding him because he's their best receiver. Um, that's some volatility to, to think about and, and maybe embrace as you make your Tayamu lineups. And I would assume Tayamu plus cutie because of the cost is going to be like virtually unowned as a stack. Right. So, you know, that, that looks pretty nice, especially in some of the larger tournaments. For me, I think I'm going to lean more into Brandon Smith and Kelvin Harmon just for the salary savings. And they are similarly projected to cutie um, in our stuff right now. Uh, for showdown, I guess you could think about Chris Roland maybe, but I don't feel great about it, especially if you think cutie dominates the slot role. I don't really see where Chris Roland fits in. Um, and then, you know, tight end here is just really, really tough. Uh, all three of their tight ends last year. These tight ends play a lot and they have pretty good touchdown equity, but they also rotate. All three of these tight ends last year averaged between like four and six fantasy points per game. Uh, for showdown, it does feel a bit like you're just guessing, but, um, you know, our, our projections have a bit of a lean. I can't say I'm um, 
I'm super enthusiastic about, uh, you know, playing a, any of these tight ends that, you know, you're just hoping one of them can, can catch a touchdown in showdown. Um, the backfield's pretty fun though. Uh, Cameron Harris is expected to effectively be the bell cow. Uh, this backfield, you know, earns almost no targets. So anticipate pretty much just all carries, um, here for Cameron Harris, but we saw Abram Smith, you know, last year around 75% snap share earned, you know, almost all the goal line work outside of, you know, the quarterbacks who have a significant goal line role here. Um, yeah, if you think, you know, DC dominates this game, I kind of like the idea of playing Cameron Harris plus the DC defense, um, something like that, because he's just going to get fed carries. I mean, the coaches have, have said as much Darius Hagan's is working as the RB2, but I don't think they have a lot of faith in him. They brought in, I noted in my article, they brought in uh, Zaquandre White for a quick look like a week and a half, two weeks ago. So, I mean, if you're still bringing people in, you probably don't feel great about your RB2 overall. Um, do you have a take on this backfield? Yeah, to be honest, I, I came in today thinking I was going to maybe make an argument for uh, Hagen's just being like, you know, follow, following his coach. You know, maybe there's some goodwill there, maybe gets, but I think it, you, you you kind of talked me off of it a little bit. I think it probably is Cameron Smith, at least for this first, or sorry, Cameron Harris, at least for this first game is likely to get the workload here and we're probably not going to see enough Reagans for it to be worth it. So yeah, I think that uh, Harris definitely, you know, uh, if you can get that Abram Smith role, that'll we'll take that all day at 7,500. Um, so I think I'm with you that Cameron Harris, a, a pretty interesting running back here. I do, I do want to note uh, just from the, the tight ends, if I were to play one, Caden Smith is at least, you can make an up, you can make an argument there. He, he's 4,000, um, has a little bit more receiving pedigree. Like we kind of know what the other tight ends here. He's another, you know, former NFL guy. Maybe he comes in yeah. and, and has a bigger role than we expect. So I think he, th there's an upside case there for Caden Smith. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I mean, generally speaking, if you just lean into the guys who have real NFL experience, you'll, you know, you'll do pretty well in, um, in spring football. My one note with Cameron Harris, you know, obviously he, he projects well, he's only 7,500, which, which I really like. It makes him a pretty strong value, um, at the running back position, but it's a similar issue to Davion Smith, except Davion Smith probably has better overall touchdown equity than Cameron Harris, where if, you know, if DC falls behind, if San Antonio gets a big here, uh, Cameron Harris is going to be relatively uninvolved. Um, and yeah, again, at the goal line, Jalen McClendon might steal some carries as the backup quarterback. Jordan Tayamu will get some design runs. So you can paint a downside case for Cameron Harris, but he's also looking at, you know, 18 or 20 carries as potentially a median outcome here, which is, which is pretty nice. If you watched Abram Smith last year, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll remember the, the fantasy potential. Yeah. Um, all right. So moving along here to the San Antonio side of this game. Chase Garbers is going to be the second most popular quarterback of the slate behind McCarron. I think especially in single entry, you're going to see Garbers and McCarron really get steamed. Um, and to me, it, it makes a ton of sense. We saw Brandon Silvers uh, before he got hurt with this uh, San Antonio, or excuse me, San Antonio offensive coordinator is AJ Smith, who was with the Houston Roughnecks last year. Same with their head coach, Wade Phillips, also with the Roughnecks last year. They moved that whole coaching staff over to the San Antonio Brahmas. Um, last year we saw the Houston Roughnecks starting quarterback, more of a pocket passer, Brandon Silvers before he was hurt weeks one through four average 19.5 passing fantasy points per game. That's really, really good. We also saw rushing threat Cole McDonald average eight and a half rushing fantasy points per game in his two starts. So the best case scenario for Garbers who can both run and we believe is trusted as a thrower Cole McDonald really wasn't last year. The best case is that, you know, he averages a ton of passing fantasy points. He's an accurate passer. He's about as capable as Brandon Silvers was. And then he also gets that really, really strong Cole McDonald rushing role, which was um, a lot of carries at the goal line and short yardage. So it's really easy to paint an upside case for a guy like Chase Garbers, um, who, you know, AJ Smith hailed his athleticism. I think the, the rushing element is why he beat out Quentin Dormady. Um, I noted that in my article. So yeah, I think, like I said, I, I see a lot of potential upside for, for Garbers at the same time. It is a new spring league quarterback. So, I mean, he could be absolutely terrible. We also, from what we understand, there was a bit of a QB battle between him and Dormady. So there's a benching risk if he throws an interception or two, probably not one, but, you know, two plus. Um, I, I would be a little worried about him getting sat. Uh, but his receivers are really talented, too. I mean, you have Cody Latimer, who's projecting as a solid value, and, and John Trey Kirkland. Uh, how are you approaching Garbers in this passing attack this week? I mean, you, you know, I love it as a as the world's number one San Antonio Brahmas fan. Um, I think even even separate from my fandom, I think that I would be pretty excited about this situation. He is the third best projected 
quarterback uh, on the slate, and he's only 8,500. The you know the the top eight of the top eight quarterbacks, all of the others are more expensive than Chase Garbers. He is the as I said the third top projected, and we have him at only 19 and a half percent ownership. So yeah, it's you know he is the second highest owned, but like he's in he's not that much higher owned than a lot of the other quarterbacks. Um, he he yeah he did he had a battle with Quentin Dormady and we saw Quentin Dormady was actually really good in the XFL yeah. last year and he beat out Quentin Dormady uh in the spring and you know I watched an interview with Wade Phillips and he said it was basically like yeah he just like straight up uh guy asked him like was this just like based on your gut I know you're an old school guy did you just like in your gut like he was like no just like the stats like you know we, we track all the stats in the spring he just he was a lot better uh and he, uh, Wade Phillips even noted in that interview that he rushed for over 400 yards in his last year at Cal, which I kind of like that. So like, I like hearing it from the coach. Like it, it's, yeah. it's one thing to know that a guy like had some rushing pedigree, but if they're not like a guy who's like necessarily known for the rushing upside, I want to actually hear it from their coach that like part of what they like about him is the rushing upside. You noted in your article and uh, in the interview that I saw, like he, he's mentioned multiple times, like this guy is an athlete. He was a rusher in college. So the fact that Wade Phillips likes that uh, he is a runner, I really love that. Uh, the price is right for Garbers at 8,500. And as you said, we also like the pass catching options there for the Brahmas. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, I mean, if he's coming in at under 20% ownership, I'm he, he's one of the quarterbacks I'm leaning into. I'm going to be uh, definitely above the field there on Chase Garbers. Yeah, like I said, I, I could see Garbers getting getting steamed a bit because he is a very, very strong value, especially, like I said, in, in single entry stuff. I think he will be quite popular. Yeah. I mean, him and McCarron will take up, I, I don't know, 70, 80 percent of total quarterback ownership in single entry. I, that, that wouldn't shock me. Um, and yeah, his top two passing options are, are very clear. Uh, Cody Latimer is, is your top value. He's uh, really, really good. You know, you'll remember him from the NFL. He is a dominant. Um, he's going to play mostly the slot in San Antonio. He's listed as a tight end, but really a tight end in name only. He's, you know, he's effectively just a, a big wide receiver out there. Um, so I really like Cody Latimer as a play. And then John Trey Kirkland. I mean, he was an MVP candidate in last year's XFL before he got hurt in week five. Um, another really, really good player. After that, it gets a little vague. We have Marquez Stevenson penciled in as the clear wide receiver three right now. Um, AJ Smith called him the fastest player in the league. Uh, so I think, you know, there could be some potential juice for Stevenson, but it, you know, it is hard to see a ton of room for upside for these other guys when Latimer and Kirkland are going to soak up half the targets, maybe more. Um, so, you know, I, I think if you're getting a little weird with it, Stevenson is is interesting. And then Justin Smith is also penciled in as the other starter, but we expect that to be a pretty gross rotation between him, Katie Cannon, and TJ Vasher. Um, TJ Vasher is terrible. Katie Cannon and Justin Smith are basically the same player, uh, like deep ball cardio type specialists. Um, uh, I don't know. Do you have any opinions on these sort of ancillary guys for San Antonio, or are you mostly just stacking Garbers with Latimer and Kirkland? I mean, it's going to be primarily Latimer and Crooklyn. I'll probably mix in a little bit of Stevenson just because uh, it's kind of anytime you get a, a great offensive coach with a speedy guy, you can just hope that it's going to be the Dolphins all over again. Just like, yeah, get the ball to your speedy guy. Let him do his work. Um, mm -hmm. So that's at least and the fact that, um, you know, he's calling him the fastest player in the league. You know, that, that tells you that there, there's at least upside there in Stevenson. Uh, Justin Smith, man, I, I kept playing him last year. We really thought he, he was on the rough deck. So I guess he is, he's following the coaching staff over. Um, yeah. they, they, they talked him up last year a lot. Uh, so they, they there is some promise there in Justin Smith, uh, coming in and, and taking on a bigger role, even though we, we never really saw it come to fruition. He let us down over and over last year. I do think that the price is right, that it might be worth taking, taking a shot or two on Justin Smith once again. Also, um, I don't know. It's, uh, Landon Acres was like, he was good. Like he, he was, I don't know if he was good. He was, uh, he had, he got a lot of uh, opportunities last year. He, he was throwing yeah. the ball a ton last year. So there's at least some possibility he holds over, but yeah, I think that I would, uh, I, I think I'm with you. Like you, you're, you're starting with, you're going to Kirkland and Latimer as the top options. Uh, I think Stevenson is probably my third favorite followed by Smith followed by acres i don't know that i'm going to be going to any vasher probably not going to a lot of acres either uh especially because it is it is a new coaching staff and i don't think he was particularly great with his opportunities last year he just had a lot of them um so yeah i think it's primarily those those top four 
Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Akers led the team in targets per game when he was active last year, but again, it's a brand new coaching staff. They really don't have any attachment to him. Um, and this slot role could be a little crowded with Latimer and Stevenson, presumably taking up most of these slot reps. Again, this is an air raid offense, so their base personnel will be 10 personnel starting four wide receivers. If you include Latimer as a wide receiver, um, that will be kind of how this offense looks. Uh, the backfield here is really tricky. Uh, we think it's going to be led by Anthony McFarlane. We're, we're fairly certain about that. Um, you know, former Steelers running back, NFL pedigree, probably a name uh, some of our viewers have heard of. The problem is, you know, the backfield wasn't super valuable last year, especially if we think Garbers is going to run a lot. We know they're going to run Garbers inside the 10. That does kill some of the touchdown equity. And McFarland's expensive. He's 8000 Uh, Neil, you said we were a little low on his projected ownership, which we have at 3% just because he, he is a poor value. Um, where do you kind of see him at? I, I just, I would be surprised to see him if he does come in at 3%, I would actually love, uh, taking advantage of that playing some Anthony yeah. McFarland. Once again, a former NFL guy coming in, uh, you know, same colors and everything coming over from the Steelers, uh, to San Antonio. Um, yeah, I, I, I like him if he's going to be sub 10% ownership, I think that Anthony McFarlane is going to be really interesting. He's only 8,000. So you're, you know, relative to some of the other backs, he's not all that expensive. Um, I think that I think he's just, you know, he, he's shown the talent in like NFL preseason. I kind of think NFL preseason is a pretty good like metric for, for, for yeah. judging how the talent of a player relative to spring football. So I kind of like Anthony McFarlane. I think that he's pretty interesting. You can even pair him, I think, um, with Garbers. I think that he is not the worst uh, pass catcher in the world. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of like at low ownership. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in on McFarlane. I don't really see Aline as much of a threat. Um, and then Borgie, if I remember, I think Borgie did have a few spike weeks last year for the Roughneck. So I think that they, you know, even though it's not like the best spot in the world, like he, they, they used him at the goal line, as I recall, pretty frequently, like he did have uh, his spike weeks last year. So I kind of think McFarland is probably due for a similar, like he'll have his weeks where he is a, the top or one of the top two running backs in the league. Um, you know, may, maybe we can't expect the one to one there, but I, I think at, at low ownership, I'm definitely willing to take some shots on McFarland and, and hope that the role right. is, you know, the same as Borgie or, or obviously we'd, we'd like for it to be even better than Borgie. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think Borgie is, is the best comp and he did push for, you know, a few 20 point games last year. Um, and you know, with the way, uh, scoring is in these spring leagues, 20 points from a running back is generally all you need to be right there for, for first place in a larger tournament. So I could certainly see it with McFarlane. I think you're right. I think we are a little low on his projected ownership. He's a recognizable name and he's expected to be the lead back in what should be a pretty good offense. Um, so I think I'll probably bump him up a bit after the show, but I really don't see how you could get him above like 10% because he just doesn't project that well. Maybe if we find out one of these other running backs is going to be inactive, uh, that, you know, that could help his projection a little bit, but you know, relative to these other guys, he's just not going to pop as a strong value, which, you know, like we've noted with other players before, uh, you know, he does have upside. So you could kind of embrace the volatility there behind him is going to be John Lovett and Bryson Aline. Uh, they're going to be fighting, I think mostly for third down back roles and like spelling McFarlane. Um, Aline weighs 165 pounds. So his touchdown equity is, is literally zero. Um, I guess you could argue for him in like a showdown type format because he is, he is pretty explosive. Like he could rip off some, some long plays. I mean, obviously a guy who weighs 165 is going to be pretty quick. Um, and then John Lovett carries maybe some touchdown equity. He's the heaviest back on the roster. Um, but you know, didn't really impress with the, the Vipers last year. I wouldn't be shocked if one of these running backs was inactive. Uh, but I think, uh, AJ Smith generally prefers to keep three backs on his team. Cause if I remember right, there's a game last year where they went into it with two backs and one of them got injured and uh, he never went with two after that. Um, so he might, might have a little PTSD um, from that, but yeah. Oh, and then I guess, I mean, for showdown, Alizé Mack, potentially uh, he's going to be Cody Latimer's direct backup at like that tight end sort of move wide receiver spot. Um, he could catch a touchdown. I just don't see much room for playing time there. Uh, really just a, a thin showdown play. Um, all right, Neil, unless you had any other notes, ready to move on to this last game? No, yeah, I think I think that that is uh, spot on. I think Alizé Mack, maybe, yeah, for, for showdown. He, 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 I think he had a couple spikes, spike weeks last year that were good enough for showdown. I don't even know if he might have had one. I feel like he might have had one two-touchdown game last year or something like that. I think that uh, they, they had two NFL tight ends on their on uh, on the roster last year. Uh, but yeah, no no other notes. 
Yeah. All right. So our final game here is the Memphis Showboats at the Houston Roughnecks. This is a Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern time kickoff. Uh, Memphis is favored by one. This actually opened with Houston favored. Uh, total here is 41. I have still seen some offshore books hanging a line where Houston is favored. And I really, really like the Memphis side of this game. To me, Memphis has a clearly better quarterback in Case Cookus, much better coaches, um, and are just an overall better team. We, you know, we expect them to score a lot more points this year than Houston. Houston could be, you know, they could be okay, but they could also just be a complete disaster. If I had to pick one team to finish last, I would, I would bet it all on the Houston Roughnecks, unfortunately. And for those of you wondering, uh, the Houston Roughnecks playing in this game are the Houston Roughnecks in name and uniform only. This is a holdover from, uh, or a carryover of the Houston Gamblers roster and coaching staff from the 2023 USFL season. Convoluted, I know, but that's what the league decided to do. To do. They gave the old gamblers the Roughnecks name and uniform. They kept the old gamblers coaches. They kept the old gamblers players. So we're basically dealing with last year's Houston gamblers, which were not particularly fun to watch. Um, all right, Neil, any uh, any bets here before I talk about injuries? I, I already noted that I really like the Memphis side. Yeah, definitely the Memphis side for me. Also, yeah. I'm I'm not a believer in these Roughnecks. As I recall, you were a, you were a big Roughnecks guy last year, uh, back when back when AJ was was on was was the Roughnecks coach. Uh, but you're you're banning that. You're you're no longer following the. You, you've moved over. You're, you're with me, right, on the Brahmas? Oh yeah. As soon as I uh, as soon as I bank the the 50k to first, I'm gonna buy a bunch of Brahmas gear. Love it. Yes. Um, I have I have some Roughneck stuff sitting in my closet. I looked at both my stars and my Roughnecks hat before the show, and the choice was pretty easy. I'm not. Not wearing that roughnecks crap um, any much anymore because <laughs> man that was uh, just kind of disappointing how that how that shook out in in some ways but you know still gotta still gotta drop our analysis here the Memphis side I think could be oh let me talk about injuries actually first um, yeah. because we do have some notable ones here so on the Memphis side Sage Surratt has been their starting tight end limited in practice with a hamstring injury we do expect him to play but that's worth keeping an eye on we should get final confirmation tonight. Really not too worried about it. On the Houston side, and this is really the only big injury news of the slate, star running back Mark Thompson hasn't practiced all week due to a knee sprain that he suffered early in camp. I think he's likely to sit, if I had to guess, maybe 75%, 80% likely to sit. Um, we should get confirmation on his game status tonight when they re- release team depth charts and inactives. And then tight end Woody Brandom also looks questionable. He did not practice on Thursday. That's not super relevant for fantasy purposes. Really just a note for showdown um all right now we can get into the memphis side of this game again i think this is going to be a pretty great team for the purposes of fantasy football uh this is uh you know the memphis showboats but the coaching staff is the coaching staff from the new orleans breakers of the 2023 usfl the new orleans breakers last year actually uh averaged more plays per game it was right around 63 than any team in both leagues combined so they move pretty fast they also lean pretty pass heavy so this is going to be a pretty favorable offense for quarterback Case Cookus um, to throw in. The problem is that after Jonathan Adams and Sage Surratt, who we can pretty safely assume are going to be the lead receivers, we aren't exactly sure who to pair them with. Um, do you have any takes on Cookus, this Memphis offense, these wide receivers? Yeah, I mean, Cookus is a little bit just too expensive. He's 10,000 and he yeah. is the fifth best projected quarterback uh, on the slate. He's coming in at 10% ownership. So coming in at higher ownership than Matt Corral. Um, I think that he, he's in play. Like he, he's not a quarterback that I would want to completely write off, but I, my guess is that I come in underweight to the 10% we have going to cook us. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's a little bit tough to break down this wide receiver core. Um, I, I think if I were going to, pair him with anybody actually let me let me take a look at our ownership projections because that is definitely going to affect who i want to play him with here um yeah sage Surratt, obviously if he if he does play which as you said we were expecting six thousand looks really good projects really well definitely somebody to pair him with uh jonathan adams coming in at just under five percent ownership going to jonathan adams so pretty low owned stack overall i kind of like that i kind of think that's an interesting stack to go with you you might even you could consider doing a double stack. Um, I also love uh, just based on the ownership. We have Vinny Papali coming in at under one percent ownership. He's actually projected as the thirteenth best uh, wide receiver or tight end on the slate. So I'm kind of into Papali. 
Um, you know, maybe I now that I'm going through the how low owned these pass catching options are, it kind of makes me like playing Cookus more. So maybe, maybe I'll get closer to that 10% than I was anticipating, just based on these these receiving options are coming in so low owned and they project pretty well, which kind of you know brings him up, uh, bumps him up a little bit in my mind. So um, yeah, I think I'm kind of into it. Yeah, so um, Sage Surratt and Adams are both holdovers from last year's Breakers team, so we can feel pretty confident in their role. The slot role will either end up in the hands of Vinny Papali, uh, who was on the Showboats last year, or uh, Lee Morris, who was with the Breakers last year. I could see it going either way. We do lean Papali for for what it's worth right now. Um, and then the wide receiver three, the other outside wide receiver spot, it looks like around the industry, everyone's projecting it to be DeAndre Overton. DeAndre Overton is is bad. Uh, 10th worst among 74 qualifying wide receivers last year in yards per hour run. Really never did anything with Philadelphia. Um, so I would anticipate maybe, or, or I guess if I had to um, you know, just pick one of these wide receiver three candidates out of a hat, I'd rather take a chance on a guy like Daywood Davis or D. Anderson than DeAndre Overton, especially if Overton's going to be popular. Um, I mean, he's cheap, so I guess you could make the argument for Overton there. I could see, you know, the potential for a 50 or 60% route share out of a guy like Overton. Um, but how much, I mean, you know, this wide receiver three is going to be the fourth pass catcher on the team behind Surratt, behind Adams, behind whoever's playing in the slot. So it's, you know, I just don't see a ton of upside here, um, especially if Overton's going to be popular. I'm, I'm not really about it. I think there are better dumpster diving options. Um because you're really not gaining much in terms of projection relative to some of these other guys who are in that in that 3K range. And again, I mean, you don't really have to even go down there. Do you have any takes on? Um, I don't. I don't think I'm going down there just because yeah. you know you, you can play the who we're expecting to be the top options at low ownership. Uh, so I don't think I need to be dumpster diving beyond those options. Yep. Yeah. I think I think that's fair. And then this backfield is is really interesting. We anticipate this being right there as the most valuable fantasy backfield in the UFL. Um, we saw last season with the New Orleans Breakers, obviously Wes Hills, who you know now on the Michigan Panthers, uh, was like an uber bell cow. Like I said, the greatest bell cow in modern spring football history. Uh, they have the same running backs coach as the New Orleans Breakers did last year. Same offense coordinator as the Breakers. Same head coach as the Breakers. So you could argue this Memphis Showboats team will really want a bell cow like Wes Hills. Um, the problem is that there's no one who really has the all around skill set to fill that role on this roster. Darius Victor is pretty clearly going to command the vast majority of uh, rushing attempts and, and certainly goal line usage. He's built like a bowling ball. He's 5'8", 210, like Maurice Jones drew size. Um, and yeah, really, really good goal line back, but not much of a route runner. So we can't quite project him for like a Wes Hills type role. I mean, obviously if we did, he would, he would be the best running back play of the slate. Um, but I do think his, his median, like what we have right now, probably doesn't reflect the upside that he has. If he does somehow slide into this Wes Hills role, because if it's going to be anyone, it'll be him. He's a team captain. Like I said, very, very good runner. Um, Trey Williams is fighting for, uh, fighting with Titus Swen for RB two duties. We have Trey Williams winning that right now. Uh, Trey Williams, I mean, he's, he's 30 years old. He's kind of, well, I guess actually both him and Victor are close to 30. Um, but Trey Williams ended last season on a really weird note, like freaking out on Twitter over his running back coach, not playing him and hmm. all this stuff. So I, I don't know if that's particularly relevant. Uh, not really something we've baked into our projections, but maybe just worth noting. I think there's a slightly better chance than the industry implies that the RB two here is actually Titus Swen, which is probably just a note for showdown because these guys are looking at, you know, the rush attempts outside of the red zone um, and then, you know, some receiving work. And a final note that I will say on Darius Victor is that last year's New Orleans Breakers offense set the modern spring football record for total red zone carries by their backfield with 64. We expect the vast majority of those to go to Darius Victor, his touchdown equity. Um, I think even relative to guys like Davion Smith is, is pretty much unmatched. Uh, I, I think it's, it's very, very strong. Um, so yeah, any anything to uh, to comment on with this backfield? Yeah, I mean, yet another running back that I prefer over uh, Davion Smith. I think that <laughs> yeah. Darius Victor. Uh, the, the floor isn't really high for Darius Victor, but uh, the the ceiling is definitely there. And yeah. um, I mean, I guess we have them projected pretty similarly. They're projected. Darius Victor projects slightly better, uh, comes in slightly higher ownership than Davion Smith. Um, and he's slightly more expensive. So they're, they're actually pretty similar, but I, I, I think I would lean into the the Victor range of outcomes a little bit more than Devion Smith, just because if he does have that role, it could be, uh, he could really put up a huge score. Uh, the floor is not very high relative to his salary. So he's not the safest play in the world, but yeah, I think Darius Victor uh, 
yeah, I, I like him at 8,400. We've got him around 25, 26% ownership. I think that that's pretty fair. That's probably around, like, I don't think I'm taking a huge stand on Darius Victor. I think that the ownership, yeah. you know, is, is pretty fair. And I don't really think I'm going to be getting to a $6,600 Trey Williams. I think I, I would be more likely to place when, uh, but I'm probably not playing the backup running backs here. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm under, um, under appreciating the potential role for a, a Williams or Swen, but I, I don't think I'm going there on the main slate. Uh, definitely more of a, a showdown or, or two games late kind of plays. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm definitely with you there. I do think, I mean, after talking about this show, I do think it's, it's worthwhile to probably bump down Davion Smith a little bit, just given that it seems like everybody kind of prefers these other running back options to Davion Smith. Um, all right. So I don't really have any other notes on the Memphis side of things. Oh, I guess I will say that like similar to these other workhorse running backs, Darius Victor would be would fall victim to negative game script would be really how he fails. You know, Memphis scores one touchdown total overall and gets, you know, loses 21 to seven or something like that. There's basically no chance Darius Victor is getting you there because he's just not going to catch many passes. Um, all right. So moving on to the Houston side, which is going to be my least favorite side to discuss of any game that we've talked about so far. Uh, we have Jared uh, Guarantano. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, has been named the starting quarterback. However, head coach Curtis Johnson has said that he is 99.99% sure that the backup quarterback, who I think will be Nolan Henderson, but I don't believe has been announced yet, um, will play uh, in this game. Uh, they said, you know, he's going to get a series. They said maybe like third third series of the game, something like that. Um, if there's somehow live lines for this game, it might be worthwhile thinking about betting uh, the Memphis live line as soon as Nolan Henderson comes into the game, in case he throws the worst pick you've ever seen. I don't think they have confidence in really any of these quarterbacks. Um, but, you know, it kind of makes sense. This is a team built around running back Mark Thompson, who, again, is probably going to miss this game. Um Man, yeah, it's it's really tough, and it it's unfortunate too because they have two great receivers in Justin Hall and Isaiah Henney. Justin Hall is really really good. I'm I'm shocked he's not on an NFL practice squad somewhere. And Isaiah Henney is similarly talented. He led the entire 2023 USFL or actually all spring football players in target share uh, last year with 25. percent So yeah, they're both you know priced up. Um, Neither Justin Hall nor nor Henny projects amazing, and it's just because we don't have a lot of faith in this quarterback situation. I think out of the eight quarterbacks, if you're crossing someone off your list, it's definitely going to be Jarrett Guarantano, right? I think I am crossing him off my list. Uh, I, you can you can make the case just because he is so low owned, and we we've talked several times about how you should embrace the volatility. We really don't know all that much, so maybe maybe we should be embracing it and saying, "Hey, he's sub five percent owned. Maybe he's going to be something that we." Uh, don't expect but the fact that they're playing multiple quarterbacks we don't think that he's all that good I think that I am just crossing the, the quarterback off the list and I'll have uh, some receivers as one-offs but I don't see myself playing any uh, on the main slate I don't see myself playing any Guarantano I think that on, on the showdowns or even the two game slate I think that I might uh, take yeah. some shots on Guarantano uh, but at least on the main four game slate I just think that there are other options that are still coming in relative like we have several sub 10 percent owned plays that I think are really interesting so even at five percent i i don't think i'm going there yeah yeah i think that makes sense i mean guarantano is a guy who averaged less than one passing touchdown per game and his 40 career college starts at tennessee and washington state that's that's pretty bad but if you wanted to make an upside case he should get plenty of deep shots or at least a few you know chances for deep shots head coach curtis johnson was really complimentary of his arm strength said that he had a very clear uh, vision for how the offense would be run with guarantano and it involved a ton of handoffs to mark thompson who again may not play in this game and a lot of play action where they just chuck it deep probably to justin hall or isaiah henny um, yeah, I'm kind of with you. I think I'd rather just play Henny or Hall as, as a one-off. Hall would be my preference, but ownership um, also prefers him. He'll be more popular overall. I, I think it's fine. Um, beyond those two, we'll get to the, the backfield here in a second. Uh, beyond those two, Anthony Ratliff, Williams, and Kiki Chisholm will be battling it out for duties on the outside. Um, I don't love either of these players. I think Chisholm has decent touchdown equity because he's huge. He's 6'5". Anthony Ratliff Williams has always been like, to me, a paper tiger version of an actually good wide receiver where like you watch a move and it's like, oh, he could be, he could be good. And then just never really happens. Um, uh, so yeah, those guys are probably only in play for like two games showdown type stuff. Um, Chisholm is really cheap. He's 3,300. So if you, you know, if you think he has good touchdown equity, which I, I think it's okay. Um, Cause they did, you know, 
seemed to like throwing him some jump balls in the red zone last year. Um, maybe he's worthwhile as a, as a four game slate punt, but you know, like we've said before, don't really need to get there. Um, Kirk Merritt is listed as a wide receiver. The team has said he's probably going to play more of like a third down running back role, which does kind of complicate things because again, if we assume, uh, okay, I'll say if Mark Thompson plays, he's the Derrick Henry of spring football. He's the only guy that we've seen earn like a workload remotely comparable to what Wes Hills did last year. He's a very, very good rusher. He's built exactly with Derrick Henry. Just assume he's the Derrick Henry of spring football. It's, it's what it is. Again, I think he's probably 80% to sit, which leaves us with Kirk Merritt in like a th weird third down hybrid wide receiver running back role. I don't see a ton of upside with anything like that. Um, Tion Evans, who is new to the team and has been praised heavily by head coach Curtis Johnson and camp. And then TJ pleasure pleasure, um, who was in a bell cow role last year in the two games, Mark Thompson missed. He actually had a hundred percent snap share in one of those games. I uh, averaged about 19 touches per game in those contests. Um, those guys would be occupying the backfield right now. We have a pretty gross split projected pledger is priced up at 7,700, which uh, we have him for 18% ownership. That feels a little high to me. I'll, I'll probably bump him down a bit. Um, if I had to pick someone in this backfield, I guess it'd be Tion Evans. Cause he's, he's cheap. And maybe he, you know, maybe it's a 50, 50 split between him and pledger. Maybe he carves out a bit of a bigger role because the head coach seems to clearly really like him, but I don't know. How do you handle this backfield? If we assume Mark Thompson is out. I, I was coming in expecting this to be the one spot uh, that I would be able to recommend Pledger because I was thinking, well, just look at when Thompson was out last year, he was yeah. the workhorse guy, high run rate team. They, they like to run the yep. ball. So like all of that working in Pledger's favor, maybe he is going to be a workhorse at relatively low ownership and a reduced price tag. Uh, obviously, all assuming that Mark Thompson's out. If Mark Thompson's in, yeah, you're just playing Mark Thompson. Yep. Um, but I, yeah, I would expect Thompson to sit. So then I'm like, Pledger's sort of interested at 7,700. You've kind of convinced me though. Tion, Tion Evans is probably like relative to his price tag has the best upside at 5,100. Uh, nobody is going to play him. What, what do we have the ownership at on Tion? Let me, uh, pretty much zero about 1%. Yeah, un under 1% ownership. Doesn't take that much to pay off that 5,100 coach talking him up. So, um, yeah. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe he's, maybe he's the guy. I guess we, we don't know for sure that Pledger is going to, uh, be, be the bell cow if Thompson sits like he was last year, particularly given how much the coach seems to like Tion. So, yeah, I think, I think Tion is probably, probably the guy that I would have the most interest in. And I, I do have a little bit of interest here just because they are a team that likes to run the ball. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe gets enough looks to pay off that 5,100. That's a lot easier to pay off 5,100 than 7,700. So, uh, I think that I'm sort of into it at low ownership. Now that again, doesn't mean I'm going to be playing 20%, but if I play 5% T on and he's coming in at 1% own, I'm, I'm well over the field. Maybe I get to 10%, um, but probably in that five to 10% range, uh, in my, I'm, I'm only, I'm, I'm playing 50 lineups as of right now is my expectation. So I'm probably, probably five to 10% there on, uh, on T on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. Again, you know, this is, this is pretty tough. I think, you know, close to a 50, 50 split is, is reasonable to expect. I'm, I'm not necessarily sure who they'd lean into at the goal line. Um, but yeah, you know, you could see, I mean, if Pledger earned 70% of the touches, I, I wouldn't be shocked. I, I guess I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, Tion Evans did it either. So I could see leaning into either side of this. Um, yeah. Final player I'll mention here, Cyril Grayson's on the roster. Some of you may remember him from his time with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I just don't really see where he fits in. Justin Hall and Isaiah Henney should dominate slot work. Um, and that seems to be where Cyril Grayson would play. I mean, maybe if you're a showdown sicko, he could catch a long touchdown or something. I mean, he you know was an All-American track star at LSU back in the day. So he probably still has great speed at 30 years old. But I wouldn't be surprised if he was an active either. Um, yeah, I think, Neil, that, that just about does it for the week one UFL breakdown. Do you have any final notes before we get out of here? I'm still debating whether I have any interest in Kirk Merritt. Uh, I don't think oh. I do. Yeah, I it just I, I sometimes like those like ugly situations where it's like, well, he's not really a wide receiver. He's not really a running back. We don't really know what he is. Just yeah. like lean into like, well, what if he gets opportunities one way or the other? Um, I don't know that I'm going to go there at 4,700. I might, I might, you know, take a shot or two, but probably not going to lean in there too much. Um, otherwise, yeah, I think that we've covered. Uh, it's largely, you know, a stay away spot for me here for the Roughnecks, with the exception of uh, Hall, Henny, and then maybe a little bit of Tion Evans, maybe a little bit of TJ Pledger. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, all right, guys, don't forget to really embrace the volatility of this slate. There are going to be huge misses 
uh, industry wide in terms of you know who we think is going to be in what role. Um, obviously, I feel really good about where our projections are at. But again, you know, it's week one of a brand new spring league, so really anything could happen. Um, and yeah, please embrace the volatility because that's how you win fifty thousand dollars playing DFS on DraftKings. Um, alrighty, guys, thank you so much for watching this show, the Fantasy Points UFL Breakdown. We just talked an hour and a half about four spring football games. That makes me the happiest guy in the world. I'm so excited for the slate. I will see all you guys at the top of the leaderboard.